what on earth is wrong with this thing? Why doesn't it work? Hello and welcome back. So what I want to talk to you about today is a present I got. This is the TR9252-A DC power supply. 12 kilograms of Hungarian heavy metal. So if you're curious about what's inside this thing and how it works, when I actually get it to work, then keep watching. This thing is massive. I mean, it has to be. It's a 15 volt 5 amp power supply designed in the 1970s. Now, even before looking inside of it, the thing that stands out is just how heavy it is. I mean, it's a 75 watt power supply. It shouldn't be that massive. But the thing to remember is that this thing comes from an age when equipment actually did what it was advertised for. I mean, if you take a modern day supply and use it to its full capability, fans will start running, protection start, will start kicking in, I mean, it will huff and puff until it will bring itself down. This thing, on the other hand, doesn't have thermal protection. I mean, heat sensors are a sign of weak design. It's like you're expecting your circuit to overheat. This device actually has a very nice parameter in the datasheet that states that if you use it at full power for 8 hours, the output voltage might vary by maximum of 30 millivolts. Now, for a device that only has a thinner reference, doesn't have op amps, doesn't have band gaps or any fancy circuitry, that is a really impressive parameter and shows just how reliably this thing was built. This device was built by the Fok Yem company in Hungary. The name actually stands for Fino Mechanikai Orvosi Kesletgyar Gengyaromu Müsterdyar. Or in other words, fine mechanics, medical equipment and low current instrument factory. Now the datasheet doesn't really tell us that this is a medical device. So this thing sort of fits into the low current 5 amps, <laughs> that's, that's low current, instrument category. But you might also call it a medical instrument. I mean, if this thing drops on your foot, then you definitely need to go to the doctor. Now, this was certainly not made for hobbyists. This is a serious piece of laboratory equipment, made to the highest degrees of reliability from the 70s. Now, this particular part, based on the date codes from the various capacitors inside, was built in the early 80s. And I got it from a friend who was cleaning out his garage and just throwing things out. And I mean, it's been sitting there for at least a decade. And before that, who knows where it was. But it's in pretty good condition. I mean, there's a bit of rust here and there. But other than that, everything is intact. It's j just broken. So I decided to try to breathe some life into it, but before doing that, let's just look a bit to see at what we can see on the outside. So on the front panel, pretty basic, power on switch with light indicator, couple knobs to set the output voltage and the fine tuning calibration potentiometer. Then we have our current measuring section. So we have a current meter, a knob to set the output current, and an overcurrent indicator. And then on the left side we have the banana plug, so to connect the supply to a load, and an on-off switch. And of course a couple handles to carry this thing around. If we turn to the back side, we see our main power connector, a fuse, 250 volt ampere rating, it's that rugged. And then on this side we have another set of connectors, so if you have this thing mounted in a rack and you want to put cables directly on the back side, you can connect them here. And we have a really nice feature that's also present in modern day high-end supplies. And that is, except for the output line, so the U plus and U minus here, we also have a couple sense pins. 
So if you're supplying a load with the rated 5 amps, because of the high current on the supply lines, you will have a certain voltage drop. So you won't be stabilizing the voltage at the load, but rather at the supply. Now to stabilize the voltage at the load, you take these sense pins, wire them also to the load, so that the power supply can sense the voltage that reaches the load. And this way you can precisely stabilize the voltage at the load. Other than that, we have these plastic spacer pins. So you have these on the back side, on the, you have them on the top side, and there's also a set of them on the bottom side. So if you put multiple pieces of equipment one on top of the other, there will still be enough space in between to have airflow. So now to show you the inside of this thing, I took some still photos. This way I won't be having a shaky camera or anything and it will always be focused. Sort of. So this is what we can see from the bottom side. We see the ginormous transformer on the right side. We see the main PCB in the middle and then the large radiator with the power dissipating transistor on the left side. So the PCB is quite simple, we can see the main rectifying bridge here in the middle, the main filtering capacitors on the bottom, and then most of the circuitry is concentrated in the upper area. If we look at this thing from the bottom side, we can see that the PCB is a single layer type, and it's hand drawn, so you have all these nice winding traces, so this was done before computer aided PCB design was a thing, and you can see that there's a lot of these fresh solder marks here and there, and uh, I did these, so these were part of my repair work. In the meantime, I managed to repair this thing, and I only had to desolder almost every single transistor to find the broken ones. It wasn't a random thing, no, 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 I knew exactly what I was doing. There are two transistors that I didn't desolder, so that's a testimony to that. Another thing we can see is, is that the main power transistor is the 2N3055, so this is a typical NPN high power transistor that was available in the 70s. And if we look for the datasheet, we will see a very interesting thing. So they list out all the part numbers, and they also list out the manufacturers for the various components. And you can see here that this 2N3055 was initially made by Texas Instruments, and then they went for the Tungsgram manufacturer. Now, to put this into a bit of context, Texas Instruments was a company from the United States, still is, and at this moment in time, Hungary was a communist country. So to get the transistor, they had to buy it from the capitalist Americans. Now, roughly at the same period in time, so by the late 70s, this particular transistor was also made by the Romanians, so just across the border, also a communist country, but the Hungarians and the Romanians get along so well that they decided either they buy it from the Americans or they make it themselves. They're not going to trade goulash for transistors with the Romanians, that is out of the question. Now if we look into the schematic of this thing, so the full schematic is listed in the data sheet, it was quite common back then, we see that this schematic has a few particularities. So one of the main issues with linear power supplies is that you end up dissipating a lot of heat on the regulating element when the input voltage is high and the output voltage is very low. So to compensate for this, what they did was have a transformer with multiple outputs. So depending on the output voltage that you set, you select one winding or the other. And this is accomplished by these switches here. So these switches are not just used to select the value of the feedback resistor, they're also used to select which winding from the transformer is used to supply the board. And this way you can keep the whole thing a bit more efficient. Another particularity that was done here was regarding the way that the power transistor is being driven. So since this is an NPN transistor, even if you would connect the base to the collector, the output voltage would still be 0.6 volts lower than the input. And since we're talking about a 5 amp power supply, you can't directly drive the power transistor, you need a few more transistors before that to amplify the signal. So the total voltage drop on this compound transistor would be quite large, so in the order of 2 volts almost. And at 5 amps, 2 volts, that's 10 watts, so that's a huge amount of power. So not to dissipate this amount of heat in a useless way, really, 
what they did was something that's similar to the bootstrap. They took a second winding, which is rectified, and to drive the power transistor, they're using this winding to supply the driver. So this way you can fully saturate the transistor to have a very small voltage drop on it without wasting too much power. And in the rest of the schematic, it's pretty simple. We have on the right side the thinner voltage reference. These three transistors represent the error amplifier, which compared the Zener reference with the voltage coming from the feedback resistors. Then transistor 6 and 7 make up the current limiting circuit. So on one side, transistor 6 is measuring the voltage drop on the shunt resistor. Transistor 7 is measuring the one on the current limiting potentiometer. And basically that's about it. We have a few more transistors to limit the current and stabilize the circuitry, but it's quite a simple circuit. But there's quite an annoying thing about this. So my main difficulty in trying to debug this thing to try to fix it was that there's no real ground point. So we have the supply that supplies the power to the output. We have the supply that supplies the driver of the power transistor. And then we have a third supply. So this 40 volt supply here on the left side, which is used, which is rectified. And then it's used to drive the whole control circuit. And the three supplies aren't really interconnected properly. I mean, even in the data sheet, in the section where they're telling you how to debug this thing, the reference voltage to which the various voltages are measured is no ground pin, but rather the positive terminal of the output. So you can't have a more unstable reference than that. But that's how this thing was designed. So this is basically the reference around which the entire circuitry works. So now before moving on to actually test this thing, there's just a few more constructive particularities I would like to show you. For example, all of the potentiometers and variable resistors in this thing are built with wire winding. So it's not a carbon film like we see in most modern day potentiometers. Now this has two purposes. First of all, it enables much, much higher power dissipation and it's also more resistant to corrosion, I suppose. So this is the way in which all these little trimmer potentiometers are built and also the large potentiometers. Another interesting thing is this massive shunt resistor. So this is basically used to measure the output current. So you have two of these resistors linked in parallel. And this is the 200 milliohm shunt resistor from the schematic. So this one. One more interesting thing about how this supply is designed is how the output switch is working. So normally the output switch you would be using to disconnect the output from the supply. But in this case, the output pin, so the positive and the negative pins are always connected to the supply. And this DC off switch to turn off the supply, it's actually acting on the output of the error amplifier. So it's short circuiting this thing to ground. It's basically turning off the signal that is going to the driver that is driving the power transistor. And at the same time, it's connecting a 240 ohm resistor to the output to discharge the capacitors. It's not used to interrupt the output. And if you're curious about what was broken in this thing, there were two transistors. So the first one was this power transistor here on the bottom side. And the reason why I'm showing you this particular picture is that the main reason why this thing broke, I'm guessing, is that this resistor, you can see it's quite burnt up because of vibration or something touched the heatsink. And before I put my nose into this thing, there was no ceramic spacer in between the transistor and the heatsink. So the collector was directly connected to the heatsink. So the transistor burnt out. Another component that was broken was one of these small transistors. Actually, I think it's this one, which to replace, I ended up committing a bit of blasphemy. I put a Romanian transistor in its place. So we could expect the supply to burn out at any moment. Just because it's repelling that component. And well, that's about it. So now let's move on and try the supply out, see how stable and how well it works. So to try it out, I got this little setup going right here. So I got my power supply and we can turn it off with the main switch. This turns on the indicator that shows that it's supplied. And to the output, I got my voltmeter connected and also an active load. So now if we fire this thing up using the 
DC on switch, so it's hidden right here behind all these cables. Right now it's set to 7 volts, so one of the switches is on 2, one is on 5. And if we don't have exactly 7 volts, then we can use this calibration potentiometer to set it to the exact value. So this will be needed with any of the voltages. So if I go now to 8 volts, it's not perfectly 8, I still need to slightly calibrate it. And we have 8 volts now. So now I can play around with the active load, set a large current. So my active load will go to almost 4 amps. So right now I'm not really sure if my active load indicator is not indicating well or this one, but I'll have to check that. We can see that the output voltage varied by 10 millivolts, but that can be because of the way the sensing wires are connected to the output. They're connected at the back side of the supply, so they're still like 15 centimeters of wiring. If I would be measuring directly on the sense wires, then the output should not vary. So we can check out the overcurrent protection. So if I turn this potentiometer, so I turn it down, at some point, the supply goes into overcurrent mode, we see this overload indicator. And I think there's a bit of smoke coming out of it. It's fine. So we can see that the current dropped. So by setting this potentiometer, we can set exactly the maximum current that we want out of the supply. So right now it's back at roughly 4 amps. And well, my active load can't really consume more than 4 amps, so I can't really test it at higher currents. But all in all, the supply seems to work. Uh, I'll need to check that smoke coming out. It's probably just the dust overheating, or, or maybe my house will burn down, who knows. But anyway, it's quite a nice supply. It still needs a bit of cleaning up, it still needs a bit of calibration, but probably I'll be using it in the future. So all in all, Hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.